I first of all would like to introduce you to our favorite assistant and person to go to, Brian Javer. Brian, raise your hand. I know that all of you have gotten um, at least one email from him. And, and he's here for your pleasure. Anything that you need to know about, Brian can find out. If he doesn't know it, he'll find it out and he will answer your questions. I can also do that. Ask can any of the other students in our department or faculty that you see around you. So the present, tonight we'll have two presentations by our illustrious responders. They're going to give us a little background on themselves and their work. Then we're going to have two, two presentations by doctoral students, at which time the, the presentations are 20 minutes. The response between, from Michael and Mindy are going to be 10 minutes, or they can invite the rest of us to join in the conversation to use up those 10 minutes. Um, I'm, I've got the timer, and I'm going to hold up a sign that says five minutes, three minutes, stop. And some of you who were here the last time you were at Ohio State um, said I was a little cranky. I'm going to be a little, um, little kinder tonight because I know that Tim, our first presenter, needs 21 minutes and a half. So... <laughs> He, I agreed that that's okay. <laughs> so if you run over just a wee, bit, a wee bit, it's fine. If you go over by more than five minutes, it does cut into your response time. And I think one of the most beautiful things about this conference is the ability to get feedback on your dissertations. So we can talk all we want about how good we are, but it's until we get feedback that we don't grow. So that's, there you go. Um, I want to thank the people from Penn State and Teachers College who are here because I know it's a long trip. I know it's a lot of uh, schlepping, getting babysitters, figuring out how to accommodate your home and accommodate being here with us. But we are so very grateful for your um, commitment to art education. Let's see. So, I would like to introduce our acting graduate chair, Dr. Jim Sanders, who will introduce our two respondents, Michael Kellner and Mindy Rhodes. I, I'll apologize for uh, uh, arriving with my Penn State uh, guests that I don't think I frightened too badly. They didn't seem to have white knuckles on the way here. But I'm glad that you're here tonight, and uh, without saying, I, I'm not sure which order. Mindy, are you going first? Oh, okay. Well, um, I, I don't need to be saying anything more because we, um, Mike Hill can introduce himself as in the process of giving his talk, and then that way your half minute will be having plenty of room. So welcome, Michael. So uh, I guess I thought when I got my PhD I wouldn't be nervous about this anymore, but that's not true. Uh, so um, my name is Michael Kellner. Uh, I got a PhD from here a little over a year ago, uh, graduated in August. Uh, my dissertation was called Creativity as Concept. It was about uh, sort of Western approaches to creative thinking um, and a sort of recontextualization of that and uh, some advocacy for that. Um, I teach now in the School of Design here, and I live in Columbus, and I'm a practicing artist. And I'm going to start this. Um, so I'm going to read just a little bit here at the beginning until the nerves go away, and then I'll talk a little bit more freely. Um, Lewis Hyde, whose works I'll reference a few times in this short talk, had an had an idea to take Ralph Waldo Emerson's uh, essay on self-reliance and rewrite it. 
So instead of having what Emerson wrote, yesterday I read in a book somebody stating very well an idea I had myself, and I felt ashamed that I hadn't expressed it myself. Hybe would write, yesterday I read in a book somebody stating something very well an idea I had myself, and I felt glad that I was not alone, and that my ideas were not my ideas. As a result of Hyde's work, an essay that argues for the achievement of the individual is now paired with an essay that gives praise to those of like minds. Hyde is not saying Emerson's essay is unworthy. He's simply saying that we are not alone and that we are richer for this. And this is the spirit I want to proceed today. Um, and speaking about a small piece of my research, I'm going to address the concept of belonging with a brief nod to its similarity um, of a, with a gift economy. I'm going to try to be specific with my language because I'm talking about something that often resists representation. As I define belonging here, keep in mind that one of the reasons I find it captivating is because it has multiple meanings. And I hope that if you have any doubts or concern about your participation here over the next 24 hours, that my words will uh, serve as some comfort to you. Um, so here we go. So the Pakistani artist Kamal Balada traces the etymological roots of uh, belonging through its English and Arabic history. And I'm going to outline these here with just a little bit of um, my own sort of personal clarification. The most commonly used version of the term in English designates a form of property, um, as in this thing belongs to me. Um, I own it. As I reflect on my own belongings, I, re I realize that this term has a pretty large capacity. So I can think about it in terms of a, like a pen, my Sharpie pens that I keep with me all the time, that if I lose, uh, I don't sort of stress about, you know, it's just like it's, it has very little sort of financial value. But if I were to think about something like my, my computer, for instance, um, I would feel that monetary impact pretty significantly if I were to lose it, if it were to disappear, destroyed. But um, I think beyond that, it has um, a greater loss um, to me because, and there's some, something beyond sort of like the monetary part of this thing, because if I were to lose my computer, I'd lose the documentation of like my artwork, but also pictures of like vacations with my wife and thousands upon thousands upon thousands of images of my kids. Um, and this, if I were to lose it, and I, I mean this sincerely, it would feel like a certain type of death in a way, like that this stuff had gone, gone away. Um, so my belongings uh, range from something that's trivial uh, to instrumental, and that range appears at least somewhat influenced by the monetary and emotional investment I put into that particular item. And I think while this is an important understanding of the term of belonging, Bellotta writes that this was not always the un English understanding of the term. Uh, before belonging came to represent personal property, it was used to speak to commonalities found in two distinct things. People search for these commonalities because of their proximity to one another, and so if I use an uh, example of like these images of physics, I could make some comparisons because they're the same sort of thing. They are both sort of popular culture items. They're you know, vinyl records. Um, they're commodities. And I still recognize that public enemies records suggest a different socio-cultural and historical identity than something like Taylor Swift. Um, the important thing here is to realize that we look for these connections because they're in spatial relationship to one another. And because they're in spatial relationship to one another, we become attuned to an understanding of their commonalities and differences. And this extends beyond objects. We are here today in this room under the umbrella of GRAE. We are friends, colleagues, students, mentors, and strangers. No matter the differences in our research or relationship to academia, we seek to find commonality and difference with each other through this experience. And yet again, this would be enough to deal with a term, except it's not. <laughs> because uh, the Arabic understanding of belonging is equally rich. As Balada breaks down the roots of the term in Arabic, he writes that belonging suggests words like grow, thrive, develop, and make progress. All of these terms suggest an activity that unfolds over time. An obvious example of an activity like this, given our current environment, would be our own research or artistic practices. Particularly when it comes to deeply investigating an idea or pursuing creative endeavors, we hope to make progress and develop as time progresses. We have also come to understand that this will not happen immediately. We understand that this requires an investment of time, and this investment of time deepens meaning and relationship to these ideas. Like our English understanding of belonging, Balada writes that the term, uh, the Arabic use of this, uh, this term has another function, specifically in the context of Arabic poetry. To be in longing for something or someplace suggests an activity that is not only time-based, but that will remain necessarily incomplete. In fact, it is the incompleteness of the task that actually cultivates bonding as in the people that share it. If we consider something like this in the context of our respective 
artistic practices or research, we realize that we all share this desire, even if our work isn't the same. We are researchers and makers in the face of some daunting circumstances. There are many things that clamor for our time. And to continue to make our art or research in this is, in my opinion, brave. So uh, we're also faced with doing all this in the age where we are expect expected to justify the worth of what we do in the space of a capitalist marketplace. And yet we continue to assign worth to things that may actively resist this hyper-capitalist market economy. Many of us continue to teach and rethink the way we want to approach this act of sharing. We do all this knowing that we'll, there's never going to be a point of arrival. From here, we can move back through the other meanings of belonging. Our again, again, our activities as researchers, artists, teachers continue to have meaning, develop, and unfold over time. Furthermore, this label of researcher, artist, and teacher is something we feel a degree of ownership over. Despite the wide variety of our respective practices, we find commonality in the pursuit of certain ideals and certain sensitivities. We are, in our own ways, able to talk about the difficulty and the possibility of doing our respective task in this era of hypercapitalism, and at the same time, read something like D.H. Lawrence's exhortation on creativity, not I, not I, but the wind that blows through me, and recognize the familiar um, sense of that. We belong together here in every sense of the word. In many ways, this sense of belonging functions like a type of gift economy, a provocative necessity in our culture today. When Lewis Hyde writes, this period of market triumphalism has seen a successful move to commercialize a long list of things once thought to have no price and to enclose common holdings, both natural and cultural, that we used to assume no one was able to take private. We nod knowingly as we have glimpsed the increased market pressures in education. While a gift economy and a market econ economy are permeable spheres, it is in the gift economy that we most often find our home. Hyde writes that a gift revives the soul, which speaks to our, a sustaining of livelihoods beyond the monetary means. And if I make it completely touchy-feely for a moment, um, I will say that as researchers, artists, and teachers, we care for a gift. We might feel as if this gift has been bestowed upon us. Our goal is to share this vulnerable, precious gift with the primary aspiration that it will be used. A gift connects and binds in many of the same ways that belonging does. So here's a small gift. Since this past June, I have been working on a project with my friend Alex, who lives and works in Austin, Texas. Every other Friday, she mails me a drawing and a, with a letter on the back. And every other Friday, I do the same. Often she and I have both written about the struggle to make art in the whirlwind of so many obligations, and yet on the other side of these letters is the very proof of our commitment to making art. When we were trying to establish the parameters of this project, I told her about William Kentridge's um, idea about his studio, that he hopes that it's a safe space for stupidity. And I wanted the work to have, that we made together to have that same sort of sensation. We want the, work, the first wor experience of this work in the world to be a welcome one. And we, wanted, we found it in these drawings and letters to each other. In our time on this project so far, we have found that these parameters are their own type of gift. I can say with certainty that this is one of my spaces of belonging. And here's a larger gift. Presenting research or any type of artwork can be a nerve-wracking experience, but we push through all the same. After all, we catch glimpses of the capacity of what we do when we share it. We push aside nervousness and stupidity and all the other baggage that we carry with us. We carve out time from family and friends and other obligations to say that this here is important. This is what makes Jean-Luc uh, Jean Nancy's work so relevant to our being here today. There is no meaning if meaning is not shared. Researcher, artist, teacher, student, audience, speaker, we are inextricable from each other. I got to go first, now it's your turn. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>